Hi, Lars. Uh, thank you for taking the time to talk to us today. My pleasure. Um, you're going to be one of the keynote speakers at the DCS this year. So I was wondering if you could give a, a brief summary of you and your career. Well, I've been in container shipping for almost 20 years now. Most of the time I've been uh, an analyst initially within Musk, the largest container line. But for the past decade, I've been running my own company focused on trying to figure out why things are happening in container, in container shipping. The easy thing is looking out the window to see what is happening. But to me, it's the why. And, and the why is, of course, also the key in then figuring out what's then going to happen over the coming, not just few weeks, but the coming three, five, ten years. So you're kind of like the, you're, you're kind of like the, the one who looks into a crystal ball and, and uh, predicts the container shipping industry? To some, to some degree, yes. Then the, the question, of course, is how murky is the crystal ball? Sometimes it's pretty clear what's going to happen. Sometimes it's murky. And at least that's been my experience over the last two decades. It is actually a lot easier to predict what's going to happen in the next five to 10 years than what's going to happen in the next five to 10 weeks. Because this is an industry where there is a number of underlying structural developments that simply takes time. And once you start to see everything moving ever so slowly, it's also fairly obvious what is going to happen on the long run, whereas it's a lot more volatile what will happen from one week to the next. So now that we're talking about the future, um, in terms of digital revolution, what would you then say is the thing that we should all um, look out for and what are you excited about? Well, you can say what I'm excited about is this time it's actually happening. And again, Think about timeframes here. Let me be a bit provocative and say, if we disregard uh, hardware, especially on the internet of things front, but look at the software front, there's nothing new. Uh, everything we've seen over the last five years or so, there is nothing new. Everything we have seen was already here 15, 20 years ago. But the difference is 15, 20 years ago, it failed to have any commercial impact. Most of it was tested, it worked technically, but nobody wanted to use it. There was a lack of willingness, maturity, commercial aptitude to actually use it back in the early 2000s. So it all fell by the wayside. This time around, obviously the technology is a lot nicer and more glib this time around, but the functionalities are mainly the same, but the difference is this time we actually have commercial traction. Uh, this was even before we were hit by the pandemic. There was a, a beginning rapid acceleration of a lot of digital tools. The pandemic is simply serving to make this happen even faster. So what has me excited is this time around, it's the second round on the digital front in the industry, but this time it's actually being used. Would you say then, if you're saying that nothing new has been created for many, many years, is that a problem for the industry? No, it's not necessarily a problem. Uh, it, it just points to that technology is not the important part. When we talk about the digital change, or you might call it the digital revolution of shipping, it, it just proves that technology is completely uninteresting because it's not technology that's been the roadblock. If, if, if technology was the issue, we would have been where we are now 20 years ago. So the issue is in business processes and in mindset. That's the interesting part, and that's what has changed. How has that changed? It has changed to the, uh, to, to the point where you will find that, no, let, let, let's make a very tangible example. That's probably easier. Look at the uptake on, for example, the Hapag Lloyd Quick Quotes or the Musk Spot and a lot of these online platforms. Now, selling something online is clearly not new. I mean, look at where Amazon was even 20 years ago. And there was nothing preventing the carriers from doing the same thing. The first uh, workable versions where you could actually sell online freight was operational uh, around 2003, 2004, but totally failed to take up. And if we try to look at why, on one hand, there was not a willingness on the part of the carriers to change the way you do, for example, marketing and pricing. They were mortally afraid of showing real prices online. That was just not a thing. So, so there was a mindset issue there. And on the shipper side, it was the same thing. There was very much a mindset that this is a 17th century horse trading market. So if you show me a price online, then surely 
it is not a good price. Then by definition, I should be able to call you on the phone and haggle and get something better. So th there was a mindset issue on both sides that needs to change. We have clearly beginning to see now that bridge be being crossed. That is wonderful. A very different example, uh, electronic bills of lading and electronic documentation. This has also been around for almost 20 years. But some of this is regulatory in nature. If you look at the impact in India when China was closed down, we are back in February, then you had congestion issues in some ports in India because in order to clear customs, you needed physical documents signed by the exporters in China, which obviously couldn't happen because these people had been sent home. That has now prompted the Indian government apparently to try to fast track changes in Indian regulation to allow electronic documentation. So again, this is something that's gonna go fast. There was already pressure in many countries to allow electronic documentation. This is just gonna go a lot faster now when it has become abundantly clear how idiotic it is that we are still in 2020 dependent on physical pieces of paper that needs to be moved around. Now that you're talking about um, Corona and the things that, that changes that has prompted, um, you're going to be one of the keynote speakers at the DCS this year. And you're going to be talking about how disruptive the pandemic um, has been to the container shipping and which changes will become permanent. Um, yep. Can you give us a sneak peek what that's going to be about? Yeah, it's going to be, I mean, the whole thing is, uh, again, I will be a bit provocative in saying the pandemic doesn't change anything, nothing at all. What it does is it accelerates an underlying trend that was already there. So you're going to see a much faster uptake of some of the digital tools out there. Uh, right now, it is a stress test of which of all the many tools actually deliver value right here and now. They will become the winners in the digital landscape. Which of the tools are not being used even now, they will very likely fall by the wayside and where do have manual process gaps. This is one thing that's gonna be accelerated. Another interesting aspect, which is also worthwhile dwelling a bit on is how will this impact jobs in the container shipping industry? Because right now you still have more than half the people in the container lines, they work from home and there are several conclusions to be drawn from that. First of all, it shows an immense amount of resilience and adaptability by everybody that we are still able to move 80, 85% of the global volumes, even though most people are now working from home. That is fantastic. But it also shows that the electronic systems that the shipping lines have are actually fairly advanced in that you are able to do this. And this is where life becomes really interesting because that is not necessarily good news for all the different employees. Because when you are able to handle so much business working from home, that also means we are on the threshold of being able to automate a lot of this. So a lot of the people that now have proven lifesavers for the shipping lines within the next three to five years are gonna find that the job prospects are gonna dim significantly. I will not be surprised if over the next three to five years, you're gonna see some 20 to 40,000 jobs disappear because of this. So do you think that um, process automation is going to be one of the developments that we should you know, keep an eye on? Absolutely, yes. Uh, and process automation from the perspective, if you look at it, moving a container from uh, say inland China to inland Europe somewhere involves 20, 30, maybe even 40 different stakeholders. And we need to separate between the physical operation of moving this container uh, that is still going to be manual. You're not going to see uh, robot trucks moving around the countryside in Germany or China. So the physical side of this, there's still going to be a lot of manual work. But on the side of exchanging information between all these stakeholders, that's what's going to be automated very, very rapidly. So at the DCS, you're going to be talking about all of this. Um, yes. Why are you excited to talk about this? Well, basically, the, the, the electronic transformation of the industry is something that has been fascinating to me for, for a long period of time. Uh, if I think back all the way to my MERS days, back in 2007, I was actually given responsibility for launching a, a pilot project. It was called Uship at the time, which was, can you make an online container carrier? Can you make a website where quite literally a customer could walk in off the street, find a product, find the price, 
book the container, pay, print his documents, and get everything done automated in inside of 10 minutes? The answer was yes. This is what we launched in December of 2007. But for the reasons I also outlined before, the market was simply not mature enough. Neither was Musk mature enough to use it, nor were the customers. They were simply not at the right point. And ever since then, I mean, I've been fascinated and looking at when is this digital revolution going to happen? And basically, this is what we're in the midst of. I, I launched a book back in 2017, outlining how this process would then proceed running until 2025. And with the pandemic now, quite a few of these aspects might actually be reached before 2025. So what exactly would you say that people can learn from your uh, keynote? I think um, I'm not sure whether learn would be the right word. What I hope to do through a keynote is to bring some inspiration and ideas to people in terms of what is it they should think about? Why should they think about changing? What's in it for them? Well, now that we've been looking into um, the future, uh, let's have a look at, a bit look back um, to, to your long career. Um, maybe you could tell everyone um, your most memorable moments in your career. Uh, that is interesting. I'm not sure whether I would necessarily call them most memorable, but some of the interesting aspects is that was inside of six months after I had taken over the position as chief analyst in Merskline. And that was something that really changed how I have approached uh, analysis ever since. Now, I do not have a shipping background. My background is as a PhD in theoretical physics, you probably couldn't get any further away from a practical industry than that. And the initial parts of my career as an analyst, I brought the analysis mindset set from physics with me, which meant that I was prone to write very lengthy and technical reports, really outlining in detail what was going on. And absolutely nobody read it or listened. Then it dawned upon me that the most important part is not to write a long document. The most important part is to really take what you have found and condense it down to a very few lines of basically what is the conclusion here and make it very clear and relevant to people. What does it mean to them? Now, if they then want, obviously they can always come and say, we would like to understand better what the premise is for this. Absolutely fine. Then there are people that will be interested in looking at the fine print, but for most people, Analysis is not about a lot of numbers and formulas. Good analysis is about being presented with something you can relate to. And, and that links over to another thing that for me is always important. And, and I teach in various places as well. When they say, can you teach us how to do better forecasting, for example? And my starting point is always the most important thing of a forecast is not that it's correct. That is only the second most important thing. The primary aspect of a forecast is it has to be acceptable to whoever you present it to. Acceptable in the sense that they're willing to listen. Because if they're not listening to the forecast, it will not influence their decisions. And if it doesn't influence their decisions, it's completely irrelevant whether it's correct or not, because it adds absolutely zero value. So again, it, it overlaps part with the first one, that whenever you do analysis, whenever you do forecasting, it has to be relevant to people. Otherwise, it's not being used and then it doesn't add value. And you said that um, you don't have a background in shipping. Um, so if you're looking 20 years back now, uh, when you started in the shipping industry, um, what advice would you give uh, yourself back then? Uh, that would be more a matter of be, be even faster in figuring out how to make conclusions relevant to the people that need to listen. Absolutely. And that's something you figure out now, I guess. <laughs> yeah, de 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 I mean, I, I think I figured that out a long time ago. I mean, uh, I've been doing this uh, as an independent analyst now for 10 years, and at least I have clients that seems to like what I want. <laughs> And I'm guessing you're going to be, be using that skill at, at the DCS this year as well. Absolutely. Yes. We look forward to, to hearing you talk. Well, my pleasure. I'm looking forward to it as well. In between your sessions, you can enjoy some awesome keynotes and workshops um, to which you can actually bookmark 
on your schedule in advance. And the event is open for 24 hours to accommodate everyone all over the world.